If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Luke chapter 2. You know, there seems to be a, a, a rule of thumb with preaching that if it's Christmas time, it's, if it's December, you always preach about one theme, one topic. Anybody tell me what that topic is? What's the Christmas? Birth of Christ. Birth of Christ. Very good. Well, I don't disagree with that rule of thumb, and I don't disagree with churches preaching the birth of Christ every December, but what I don't like about that is it seems to be that a lot of times, because of that, we don't preach the birth of Christ throughout the rest of the year. So this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach about the birth of Christ, and I'm hoping that it doesn't turn too much into a Christmas sermon, per se, but more about the birth of Christ. And the reason I don't want it to be a Christmas sermon is, and, and, and I get a lot of sneers, especially from Christians when I say this, but I got to be honest with you, just making a confession, I don't like Christmas. I really, I don't like Christmas. I don't like Christmas. I, I explained to uh, one lady in my church this year, uh, this past uh, Christmas season, how I don't like the lights and the tree and the, um, the jingle bells. I like a lot of Christmas. Thank you. The jingle bells and the, you know, that kind of stuff. And she actually said she wanted to exercise the demons from me. And, and I said, you know what? I, I started thinking this year, and God really worked on my spirit this Christmas season. This has been one of the most spiritually fulfilling Christmases I've had. And, and God really worked on me, and I just started asking the question, has the church missed the point? Has, have we really missed the point when it's come to Christmas, and especially the Christmas story? And let me illustrate how I think we've missed the point. Our typical Christmas story sort of looks like this, the image we get of Christmas. We have Caucasian baby Jesus sitting in a manger. We have Mary and Joseph leaning over him, and th these, are, these are the ones I love the best. The light shining down on the manger. The light of God coming. To, I haven't found that in the Bible. I've had people, Christians, I've talked to about this, and they go, no, that's the star. Uh, no, the star wasn't at the manger. We don't tell the story correctly. And that, this is my, my, my absolute favorite. Actually, this particular picture, and all I did was Google image, birth of Jesus picture. One of the first ones that came up. I'm not quite sure who these three gentlemen are, especially this gentleman in the bottom. I'm thinking maybe that he is the little drummer boy who I'm still looking for in the scripture. Um, but these guys, I'm guessing, are the shepherds, although shepherds are, are rugged. They were very rugged gentlemen. They weren't quite the uh, nice-looking gentlemen we see here. But this is my favorite, the, 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 the glowing heads of usually Mary and Joseph, but always the glowing head of baby Jesus. You know, he comes out of Mary and he's just, woo, and his head is glowing. And, and that's how we portray Christmas. And I just don't see that in the scripture. And so I started to ask this, this, this season, have we missed the point? And I started thinking about it. And I said, you know, what is it that the church typically emphasizes when we, when we, when we tell the Christmas story? Because we mistell it. We don't tell it correctly if you read the scripture. But what is it that we emphasize most about the Christmas story? And I realized this year that it was the birth of Jesus, right? The Christmas story is about the birth of Jesus. And that's what the church, we have taken over December for the birth of Jesus. It's all about the birth of Jesus. And so what I want to do today is just read for you the account of the birth of Jesus out of the scripture. Because if the Christmas story is all about the birth of Jesus, then you've got to figure that there's going to be a lot that Scripture says about the birth of Jesus. So I'm going to read the entire account of the birth of Jesus out of the Scripture. Now I'm warning you because a lot of, time, a lot of times in public speaking, when we read, we lose your attention. So get comfortable. The church emphasizes the birth of Jesus, so should the Scripture. should be a lot said. So get comfortable. I'm going to read. This is what the scripture says about the birth of Jesus. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. That's it. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. That's it. That's all the scripture says. She, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn, the first child she had. That child was a boy, a son. That's it. There's got to be more, right? Well, there is, because that's Luke, and Matthew also gives the birth story. The Gospel of Matthew gives us details that we don't necessarily want. Matthew says that 
he, Joseph, did not have relations with her, Mary, until after the son was born. Again, not a whole lot of information about the birth of Jesus, is there? That's all the Bible ever says about the birth of Jesus. The Bible does not emphasize the birth the way that the church has emphasized the birth as we tell this Christmas story and as we go through our Christmas seasons. So this past season, God really worked on me and he said, Matt, if it's not, or I said, God, if it's not, the, the emphasis is not on the birth of this child, Jesus, if we're not supposed to go out there and prove from the scripture that this child was born to us, what is the biblical emphasis of the birth of Christ? And God took me through a journey on Luke chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. And that's the journey I want to take you on today. Luke chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Now, as I got into these two verses, it occurred to me, the emphasis of the, of the birth story actually just answers two questions. There's two questions that are foundational to both Matthew, because you can find these questions there, and Luke will be in Luke. The first question is, who is the baby that's been born? Not was Jesus born, because that's what we try to prove at Christmas. Because nowadays, there's all this debate and argument. Was Jesus even a, a, a historical figure? Was he a real person at all? And, and I got to tell you, when you read the scripture, the scripture never tries to prove that Jesus ever really existed. A lot of people that read the book of Luke and the book, book of Matthew, some of them had connections to the historical Jesus. So when they wrote this book and this book, book started circulating, there were people who at the very least could say, my dad had contact with this Jesus. In the scripture, Jesus being born is never debated. But what the scripture does is try to tell you who that baby is. And that is the emphasis of the Christmas story, and I'm going to show you that today. Secondly, the Christmas story tries to tell you how do I identify that baby? Because unlike the pictures and the images and the Christmas plays and the movies we have about Christmas, the birth of Jesus was nothing spectacular. It really wasn't. It was a standard Jewish birth, and we can tell you that from the scripture. There was no angels dancing outside the stable. There were angels in the story I'm going to show you today. But they were miles away from the stable in the fields in between Bethlehem and, and uh, Jerusalem. The birth of Jesus was actually a whole lot more public than we tend to tell in our little retelling of the Christmas story. And as public as it was, all the people that were around Mary and Joseph when she gave birth didn't know that the Savior of the world had just been born. And so the Bible tells us who this baby is and then tells us how do we identify that baby. So if you would, stand with me, if you can, for the public reading of this scripture and prayer, and we'll get into what the scripture shows us. Luke chapter 2, verse 11 and 10 say this, or 11 and 12, excuse me, say this. Today, in the town of, of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Father God, we uh, just pray to you today, God, that you would just allow your Holy Spirit to fill this place, to illuminate our hearts, to open up this scripture. And let us know what your will is to know today, God. God, I pray that you would remove any part of me from what's said today, God. And just let your Holy Spirit use my lips and speak through me. God, open hearts that we may know your word for what it is. The word that gives life. For God, if we have ears, let us hear this morning. Amen. All right, first of all, we're going to look at, at, at the question of who this baby is, starting in verse 11. Luke 2, verse 11. Who this baby is. We need to find out who he is so then we can identify who he is and get to him. That's the whole point of the Christmas story. Let's find out who he is. Let's identify him. Let's get to him as the Savior of the world. 
In verse 11, the angel comes to the, to the shepherds who are in the field, and he delivers this great announcement. They're just doing their jobs as shepherds in the field. All of a sudden, the Bible says that an angel appeared, and it was, it was worse than that. The glory of God, it says, also appeared. Do you remember what the uh, response was of the shepherds, by the way? An angel appears, the glory of God appears, and the, and the shepherds were just full of joy, right? Isn't that what it says? They, they were terrorized. Terror struck these angels or these shepherds. When this angel appeared and the glory of God appeared, the shepherds were just filled with terror. And then the angel gives this amazing announcement. And he tells these shepherds who was just born in that stable. And then he tells the shepherds how to identify them. And he starts off this announcement by saying in verse 11, Today, today, in the town of David. Now, the act of the word today, don't miss that. That's a very important word throughout the book of Luke. Luke goes into a lot, a lot of places where he tells people, he goes, today salvation has come. Today. It's a very important phrase in the book of Luke, and it's the first thing the angel says. Today. What does Luke mean when he says today in the, in the town of David? Well, what he's saying is the history of the world has changed. Today. He's saying the world will never be the same because today. He's saying redemptive history, everything you've known about God, every way you've tried to get to God, guess what? It's now different. Why? Because today. What he's saying is everything that you Jewish people have anticipated as a future is now going to be realized today. Today, the world will never be the same. You've always tried to get to God. You've never been able to get to God. And guess what? Today is here. But he's saying more than that. He's saying also that today, God's promises to humanity are fulfilled. They are going to be fulfilled in this baby that is lying in a manger. Specifically, he's talking about the promise given in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. That out of this small, insignificant uh, town, it was really a village. When we think about the Christmas story and we talk about Mary and Joseph had to go to this crowded village of Bethlehem, we imagine this big city and hotels. There was no hotel. Big hotel, crowded hotel, couldn't get room at the hotel. We imagine this big, crowded city. It was a really small, insignificant city, village. And Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says, Out of you, Bethlehem, you insignificant little nothing village, out of you will come the ruler who's going to rule the world. He will be the king of kings. And when the angel shows up and says, today, he's saying that future is now realized. And those promises are now fulfilled today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today, the history of the world is going to change. But you know, there's something else about this that is extremely terrifying. And friends, I want you to know, Christmas is not all joy, peace, and happiness the way we uh, celebrate it. There are some things about Christmas that are absolutely terrifying and they should shake you to the bones. The fact that today has come, you know what that really means? It means that we are now, without excuse, before God the Father. Why? Because redemptive history has changed. The Savior of the world is now here before us, laying in the flesh of a man in the manger. And now we are without excuse if we die without that baby. That's what the angel is saying as he says today. Let me give you an example. In the Bible, in, in, in Luke's gospel actually, in, in, in uh, chapter 10, Jesus says to his disciples when he's sending them out, he says, but you, in chapter 10, verse 10, you, when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we will wipe off against you. Be sure of this. The kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it'll be more bearable on that day for Sodom than it will be for this town. You deny Christ. You deny this baby who has been born today. 
You are without excuse. It'll be more bearable for Sodom than it will be for you. And then this is my favorite, John chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. Listen to this. Jesus is in the upper room. He's giving the last message, really, to his disciples. He's about to, in a couple hours, go to be arrested and go to the cross and die on that cross. One of the last things he tells his disciples, he tells them, basically, you will be persecuted. This world will hate you on account of me. And he says this about the people who will hate us on account of Jesus. He says, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of their sin. Did you hear that? If I had not come and actually spoken, given my word to these people, they would not be guilty of their sin. But listen to this. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. Because he who hates me hates my father as well. Verse 24, if I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of their sin. But now they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. What does Christmas mean? What does it really mean? It means that the Savior of the world is now here, and because of that, we are without excuse. That's terrifying to me. That causes me terror because I know my own brothers and my family have not Christ. That terrifies me. I know coworkers, not well, I work at a church, so I hope not my coworkers, but you have coworkers <laughs> that don't have Christ. You have neighbors that don't have Christ. That should terrify you and cause you to witness all the more for this baby that was born to us today. Because they are without excuse. And then the angel goes on and he says, a savior has been born. Now I crossed out the word a there because that article is not actually in the Greek language. It's not a savior. The Bible actually says today savior has been born. It's more of a title, more of a name for this baby. It's not saying that he is a savior, a savior among many saviors. A better English translation would say today in the town of David, the savior the special, the only, one and only Savior has been born. So you can cross that A out of your Bible. But what does he mean? What is the angel telling these Jewish shepherds? Well, let me tell you, the Jewish people, if you were to talk to them about a Savior, you know the first thing that they would have thought of? God. There is one, one Savior of the world. And it is God and God alone. And throughout the entire Old Testament, God is continually called Savior. It doesn't necessarily use that word. It uses the Hebrew synonym for Savior. You know what it is? Deliverer. How many times have you read in the Old Testament, God will deliver you from your trials. God will deliver you from your enemies. God is our Deliverer. And in the Greek that the New Testament was written in, the synonym for Deliverer is Savior. So as this angel comes down and he tells these shepherds, a savior has been born. These Jewish shepherds are going, a God. Because God and God alone is our savior. So who is this baby? This baby is none other than God himself. This baby is God. I get a little frustrated in the modern church that we don't understand the concept of Jesus being the son of God. Because we separate Jesus and God too much. He is the Son of God, and Luke tells us why. He's the Son of God because the Holy Spirit oversh overshadowed Mary, and because of that, he will be called the Son of God. But do we have God the Father and then the Son of Jesus below him? Mm -mm. Jesus is God, and that's what Savior means here. But see, more than that, and this is where the Jewishness of these shepherds would have just, their minds would have just been totally racked. Because the angel says, a Savior, God, has been born. Oh, that wouldn't have mixed with Jewish thought very well. God is going to be born? No, God can't be born. God is God. But the angel says, this God is going to be born. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is not only God, but Jesus is man. So now we have the concept of the incarnation. 
That Jesus Christ, this baby laying in a manger, let me tell you, friends, he is 100% fully God and 100% fully man. He is God who stepped out of heaven and wrapped himself in flesh and was born among us. That's what the angel's saying on a, when he says a Savior has been born. God is now man. And this is an amazing concept. I love the incarnation. And I could stand here and just tell you hours and hours of information about the incarnation. But for today, I just want to make one point about the incarnation. The incarnation of Jesus Christ, God stepping into the flesh of a man, means he is now able to be found. Have you ever thought about that? Throughout the entire Old Testament, the Jews sacrifice and sacrifice and try to get to God and get to God, and they can never get to God. But now God has stepped into the flesh of a man, and because of that, God can now be found. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, one of my favorites says, And being found in the appearance a man. And being found in appearance a man. God is now able to be found. This baby is laying in a manger. He's tangible to us. We can touch him and feel him and grab him. God has stepped in the flesh. But again, this is not all joy, peace, and happiness. What does this really mean for us? That a Savior has been born, that God himself has stepped out of his glory and concealed himself in the, in the corruptible flesh of a man. What does that mean? Here's the sad part. That means that we need a Savior. And that's sad. That means that we are sinful. That means that we have rebelled against God. And now we have a need for God to actually wrap himself in flesh and come down to this earth and be among us. That's what Christmas is. Christmas is the realization, not that we can now just find God, but the realization that we're sinners. We're sinners. And we need a Savior. Praise God, He is a Savior. But just the thought that I need a Savior makes me say, God, I'm a sinner. Let me show you the, the idea of the incarnation uh, from one of the very first church leaders. This, this man's name was Ignatius. He was one of the first church leaders after the apostles had died out. If you really want to get good uh, reading, read the church fathers. These are the men who, who led the church as soon as the apostles died out. And, and, and these guys, like Ignatius, actually was discipled by Apostle John himself. So if I'm going to take anyone's word for it, God bless Martin Luther, I, I think I'm going to go to Ignatius. You know what I mean? This is what Ignatius says about the incarnation, about the fact that the Savior was born to us. He says this, he says, We have also a physician in the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son and Word before time began, but who afterwards became also a man of, the, of Mary the Virgin. For the Word became flesh. Listen to this. Being incorporeal, he was in the body. Being impassable, he was in a passable body. Being immortal, he was in a mortal body. Being life, he became subject to corruption, that he might free our souls from death and corruption and heal them and might restore them to health when we are diseased with ungodliness and wicked lust. That's what the incarnation is. And we give each other presents because he was born to us. We give each other presents going, yeah, yay, Jesus came. No, Jesus came means I'm a sinner. That's what the angel is saying here. Who is this baby? He's the one that changed redemptive history and he is the savior. But it gets good after this. Because the angel says, today in the city of David, a savior is born to you. He is not born to the rich. He is not born to the religious elite. He is not born to the people who are morally good and deserve God being born to them. Who is he born to? He's born to you. Isn't that good? So finally, we get a good spin on the Christmas story. This baby, this Savior, was born to you. 
Now there's a couple things about this. The angel was talking to these shepherds. And I just imagine the angel pointing at the shepherd and saying, You! He was born for you! What does that mean about this Savior? It means that this Savior is a personal Savior. He was born for you. But there's another thing, because if we read the Greek, which I get all geeky about the Greek, if we read the Greek, this word you is in the second, um, second person plural. What does that mean? That the angel is not coming down and saying you and you only. This means, second person plural, that the, the angel is saying this Savior is born for all of you. For the entire world. So now we have this personal Savior, but we also have a universal Savior. The Savior was born for all people, but including you. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Timothy 4, verse 10 says this. That we have put our hope in a living God. A living God. We have put our hope in a living God who is the Savior of all men. Universal Savior. But look at this. And especially of those who believe. Personal Savior. Who is this baby? This one who is going to change redemptive history. This one who is going to be the Savior. He is your Savior. He is my Savior. He is everybody's Savior. But He's an individual Savior, a personal Savior, especially of those who believe. Given to the world. Effectual for those who believe in Him and repent of their sins. That's who this baby is. And if you missed all of that, the angel follows all that up by saying, He is Christ the Lord. Just to make his point. That's who this baby is. Now after you hear that, what you should be doing is now asking yourself, okay, now that I know who he is, how do I identify him? Because I want that. Right? I want that. But how do I identify him? Because this birth, as I told you, was a public spectacle that nobody understood. Nobody knew that this, this baby was this, what this angel said. So the Bible says, here's how you identify this Savior of the world. The angel says, you will, this will be a sign for you. What does the sign do? What does the sign do? It directs you. It gives you information. It points you in the right direction. It says, hey, Bush Gardens is still five miles up the street. You're going the right way. And so the angel says, I'm going to give you a sign. This will be the sign to you that you are getting to the Savior. Here's how you know which baby I'm talking about. First, he says that the baby will be wrapped in cloth. Don't spiritualize this. I've heard a lot of people spiritualize this. What does it mean to be wrapped in cloth? Well, Jewish custom... All babies, newborn babies, when they were born, they were wrapped in cloth. Not like we picture in our Christmas stories with a, a, a maternity blanket wrapped around little, you know, Caucasian baby Jesus. What the Jewish people did is they would take strips of cloth and they would wrap each, the, 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 the torso and then each limb individually. So if you want to picture baby Jesus, picture a little mummy, little baby mummy Jesus. They would wrap each arm, each arm, each leg, and then the torso. And they actually did that to keep the baby warm, to protect the baby. But more than anything, they thought that it would make it, the baby's limbs grow. I don't know why, but that's what they thought. But what's the point in what the angel's saying? What's the sign? The sign is the baby will be wrapped in cloth. The Jews only did that to a newborn baby. So what's the sign? He gives a specific age. This is a newborn when you go to Bethlehem and you look for this Savior, you're not looking for a four-month-old or a two-year-old or a whatever-year-old. You're looking for a newborn so new that he would still be wrapped up in the maternity cloths. And then he says, this baby will also be lying in a manger. This is another one that I see get spiritualized. The manger means humble beginnings and all this other stuff. No, the manger is a sign to us so that we can identify this baby. Bethlehem was a crowded little village because of the census. People were coming from all over if they had any family ties to Bethlehem. Now, I can't promise you that baby Jesus was the only newborn wrapped up in cloth that night. 
in Bethlehem. But I can promise you this. That baby, Jesus, was the only baby wrapped up in cloth lying in a manger. And so the angel gets a specific location. I wish I could go into the details with you this morning. I won't have time about how there was probably only one stable in the whole village. And so now they know exactly where to go. They find that one baby, newborn, lying in a manger, and they identify the Savior of the world. And now they get to Jesus. Does that make sense? Now, I want to address some things. There is a heretical teaching in the church. A false teaching. I hear all the time. And it's this. God is a God of second chances. Have you ever heard that? God is a God of second chances. I hear that all the time from the lips of professing Christians. And they go as far as to say, God's a God of third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, whatever. And friends, I want you to know that God is not a God of second chances. And I can prove that to you in the scripture. Hebrews 9.27 It is appointed once for a man to die. And after that, go to judgment. God is a God of one chance. It's called life. And in your life, you are to find out who this baby is and identify that baby according to the Word of God. Get to that baby, that Savior of the world. Because friends, I'm telling you, we have one chance. It's our life. It is appointed once for a man to die. After that, God judges you. Go through this life. Die. Not knowing who this baby is. Identifying this baby and getting to this baby. And you will be judged. But there's good news. The book of Hebrews tells us in the fourth chapter, verse 7. Therefore... God again set a certain day, calling it, listen to this, today. God set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but go to Jesus. If you're hearing me today and you're a professing believer of Jesus Christ, you are a sure, blood-washed, committed follower of Christ. I'm urging you today to know who this baby really is, not the story that you may have grown up with. Be able to identify him so that you can witness to this community. Let's not tell the Christmas story that we've been told a hundred times. Let's tell people, not that Jesus was born, but who Jesus is. It's your job to witness for the Savior. God alone saves, but you are his hands and feet. And he uses you to spread this message. And if you're here today and you are not a true follower of this Savior, well, I urge you today to not harden your hearts. For I've spoken simply. I've told you who this baby is. And friends, I urge you, you're without excuse. Find this baby. Cry out to God. And the scripture says, he will be found by you. Let's pray. Father God, we just again proclaim you. You are God and there is no other. And God, we thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the attention of this congregation, God. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit is working on us and just capturing our hearts, causing those, God, of us who are professing Christians to be stronger witnesses for this baby, this Savior. God, let us be able to go out into this community and tell people who this baby is. Lord, if there is someone here today that, that, that has not professed and, and, and cried out, Jesus is Lord, God, let your Holy Spirit be even breaking their hearts and imparting faith into their soul. 
God, we love you and we praise you. To you be the honor and the glory. Amen.